Hi, welcome to Friesen Community Church. My name is Darren, I'm one of the pastors here, and thanks for being with us today. This week we're continuing our teaching called Honest Doubt, Deep Faith. We're taking a look at the things that may cause us to doubt the reality of Christianity. And these are often things that are come along our way, whether it is, is the Bible reliable? Is Jesus the only way to God? How, why do bad things happen to good people? These are all things that cause us to doubt in a good God. We don't have all the answers, but we can have evidence that leads to a verdict of Christianity being real. And we want to share some of these things with you in these weeks as we tackle this series. We want to help our doubts, our honest doubts about Christianity, move to a deep faith. Because doubt can either lead to a deep faith or walking away from faith totally. And we want to equip you as followers of Jesus or maybe someone kicking the tires of Christianity to understand why the faith in Christianity is actually very logical. But in reality, we can't believe what the Bible has to say without a little help from the Holy Spirit. And we're going to take a look at that in these coming weeks. This week, I'm tackling the subject is that is the Bible reliable? In sneak peek, it is. We believe that the Bible is very reliable, even though there may be, well, arguments against it. So I'm going to share this week, and I'm going to be very honest with you, it's a little bit longer of a message, and it's also a lot of information coming at you, but we believe that this is just super helpful for anyone that may be questioning maybe the reality or the reliability of the Bible. And again, I don't have all the answers, and there's always going to be more, but we want to give you some tools to say, actually, this might be reliable. So. With that all being said, would you please join me in a word of prayer as we begin this week's service? Lord, Lord, we pray as we come to you today, give us ears to hear and a heart to listen. Lord, because without that, we could have all the perfect arguments in the world, but still would deny the truth. So help us to see what is true, jettison what is false, and also just have that faith that you call your people to have. We thank you for your word and how it guides us to know you better and how we can live in life and community with you and each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's this week's message. We're continuing in our series called Honest Doubt and Deep Faith, how our honest doubts can lead us to a deep faith in Jesus. Last week, Pastor Shane tackled one of the topics that we often get stuck on, is how, can bad, or how do good things or bad things happen to good people? And he addressed some things. And again, we can never fully address why bad things happen. But we hope to give you a little bit of maybe some clarity of there's reasons why. This isn't just, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. If bad things happen to me, I don't believe in the Bible. This week, we're taking it a step further and asking the question, is the Bible really reliable? And for many of us that sit here today, we just accept it as truth. And we've grown up in the church, and we've been told this is the word of God, and we need to believe it as is. And for many of us, that's good enough. We believe it's the word of God, and it's proven itself to be the word of God. But for many of us, we come to the Bible, and we see that maybe there's some contradictory things that we see in the Bible. In the book of Proverbs, it talks about never arguing with a fool and it, because it says that you will become like him. And then all, all of a sudden, a few chapters later, it says, don't let a fool go unrebuked. So what is true? There, there seems to be contradictory things. And, and there's other places of scripture that people have interpreted things wrong as well. Today, we're going to look at a couple things that typically trip people up about the Bible. One is, I can't believe what the Bible says about X, Y, Z. And if I'm being honest with you, this is the question that actually kind of did this whole series that we're in. This summer, we were at Ravencrest, and we had a student that he says, I want to believe in Christianity. I I, kind of do, but I don't believe what the Bible says about creation. I I see biology, I see evolution at work, I see all these things. And and many times, 
Because we would say that God created man ex nihilo out of nothing and that we didn't evolve out of goo. It was an intentional process from God. But it, it was one of those things that tripped up this young man. And we're going to get into what I shared with him later. But this is one of the things that I can't believe what the Bible says about. Insert your issue here. Another is many questions boil down to the interpretation of the Bible. If you didn't know, there are other churches meeting today that would say that there are certain things in Scripture that they would say, we do it this way and this is the way it has to be because this is what the Bible says. Or we don't do it this way because the Bible doesn't speak to that. And they take it as this is the way God says. And so a lot of it happens to be interpretation of the Bible. Again, there are many churches all around the world that meet and have different interpretations of different scripture. And it comes down to interpretation. Some questions are how the Bible was composed. Well, again, I, I'm on TikTok some, and, and I'm, I'm following some of these guys that actually don't agree with me theologically and their questions. And, and I, I actually struggle sometimes with kind of rebuttaling these questions. They're, they're very well versed in the Greek and Hebrew, and if I'm being honest, I am not. I rely on software to help me with the Greek and Hebrew, but these guys are well versed. They've, they have doctorates in Greek and Hebrew, and they, 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 they sound very smart. This is what the Hebrew says here. This is how this verse and, and kind of is parsed, and, and they're very convincing in their arguments. And then they talk about, there's questions that people say, well, it was a bunch of guys that got together and said, well, this is what is true and this is what is not. Well, there is actually a way the Bible was composed, at least the New Testament for sure, that we can maybe, I don't want to say argue against, but give you some reasonings why and how the books of the New Testament that we have are, we believe, inspired truth from God. And there are three things, there are three criteria that we have, and we're going to start off with how the Bible is composed, and then we're going to move on to the idea, or I can't believe about what the Bible says. So how the Bible kind of is composed is apostolate, apostila, oh, I, can, I knew I was going to have trouble with this word, apostolicity, there we go, orthodoxy, and catholicity. These are big churchy kind of theological terms, and I'll explain them in a moment. And this is how the New Testament is, we believe, that is the inspired word of God. The first word, apostolicity, it means that it's written by someone who was an apostle or someone who was known to be with or near the apostle. So we believe that all the books of scripture were either written by an apostle, which would be like Peter, John, and others, or someone that was with them, like the book of Mark, Mark was not an apostle. He traveled with some of the apostles. And we come to find out that actually the book of Hebrews, we don't know who the author is. Originally, it was thought to be authored by Paul, but then the writing differences were so dramatic in spaces that they kind of thought, I don't think this is Paul. And again, we don't know who wrote it. There is no kind of textual, very much kind of this, this is who wrote it. So we, we guess and there's another reason why we believe Hebrews is still inspired word of God, even though we don't necessarily know who wrote it. And orthodoxy, this is one of the, the kind of ideas that Hebrews is still canon. is because Hebrews has a shared theology between all of the authors. So there are other books that the Gnostic Gospels, if you maybe have heard of these things, that were written, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, and all these other books that were written. And why they are, have been kept out of the canon is because they have theology in them that is just off, not compared to the rest of Scripture. So we would say that as long as it kind of doesn't go against something in Scripture and agrees with them, then, then we would say that that's a, that's a, a case to be canon in Scripture. The third is Catholicity. And Catholicity just means having benefit for a large number of churches. The book of 1 Corinthians in your Bible is not the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Why is this 
the first letter that we have from Paul. He wrote many letters to many different churches, but not all of them made scripture. Why? Part of the reason, well, one, we don't have that letter. The letter has been lost to antiquity. But two, some of the belief is that these other letters that were written by Paul and other New Testament apostles, they, they just had a benefit for one or two churches. See, what happened early on in the churches was Paul or another writer would write a letter to the churches, especially the epistles, and it would get handed around from church to church. And one of the reasons why some of Paul's epistles and the book of Hebrews was a canon was because that it had a wide circulation and it was an agreeance of all the churches that were around the area. These, these books were widely accepted as very authoritative and helpfulness. So these are three things that we have that it was written by someone who either was an apostle, which was one person removed from Jesus, or one person removed from the person that was with Jesus. Orthodoxy, it doesn't have any crazy theology that is opposite of what the other scriptures would say. And Catholicity, which means it has benefit for just more than just that one church. And you'll see this as you read through the New Testament. When I first started reading through the New Testament, I realized, man, this stuff is very applicable to my life. So many years removed from the writers that were writing to a specific church. That's part of the reason we would argue for these authors, these books, being canon and that they are inspired word of God. Now, there are some passages of Scripture that maybe don't have a ton of connection to other places. So we would say that no doctrine of Christianity should solely rest on highly textually disputed passages. And we see a lot of churches doing this. So there's, there's one, and you may know this because it's actually rapture season in the American church, where, again, there has been claims all over the place in the last few weeks that the end is here, that Jesus is coming back and the rapture is happening. September 19th came and went, no rapture, but it was predicted. September 21st was the next one, came and went. And September 25th, I believe, it was the other one. And many, many books have been written about why the end was in these dates. They're taking specific scripture and basing a whole theology on rapture. I'm not saying the rapture is right or wrong. I'm just saying that this doctrine, that's why we don't hold to that doctrine, is because end times is pretty murky. And there's a lot of people that have made a lot of claims about, I've, I know the numbers, I, I've done this study, it's with this Jewish festival and the moons and all this stuff. And, and granted, there is a lot to be said about following some of that, but we believe that Jesus does not, we do not know the date or time that Jesus is coming back. And just a little plug for coming up, after we finish this series, we're actually going to be going through the book of 1 Thessalonians together. And there is a passage where they quote about the end times. And we're going to talk about that passage, so stay tuned, come back. We hope you come back for that series as well. So we would say that no doctrine should be solely resting on textually disputed passages. And here's... The, the Catholic doctrine of purgatory, it's actually resting on a book that's not even in the Bible, that in our Protestant Bible, I should say. It's in the Catholic Bible, but not ours. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But part of the other reason we can rely that the New Testament is authoritative is that, well, we have abstracts of pieces, manuscripts of the scriptures. And I don't know if you know this, but we have, again, we can reconstruct 97 to 99% of the New Testament from existing ancient manuscripts. And these manuscripts all agree that this is where we're at. And, it, and it's over years. They don't necessarily take that out of context. And that's the New Testament. But what about the Old Testament? Do we just throw it out? Well, I will tell you this. The Old Testament is a little bit more murky the criteria for being canon 
is kind of a little bit, like I said, more murky in our understanding. But there are more verses and books of the Bible in the Catholic Bible than the Protestant Bible. I've, as, and I've been prepping for this message. Um, I've been sharing this with a few people. And to be honest with you, I, I, I'd like to see a, raise, uh, uh, like a show of hands. How many of you guys didn't know that? You were today years old when you found out that there's more books in the Catholic Bible than there is in the Protestant Bible. There's a few of us. Yeah. And one, the reason is because you were brought up Protestant. <laughs> Um, you just haven't been into a Catholic church. But there are more books of the Bible in the Catholic church. And I'm going to give you a little bit kind of why. But the books of the Bible that are kind of in the, these are not exhaustive. But here's some books. Letter of Jeremiah, Psalm 151. There's an extra psalm. There's one Estratas. Uh, I, again, I'm going to butcher this name because I'm not Catholic. Sriracha. I, actually, I, no, that, that's a, that's a um, isn't that a condiment? Um, <laughs> I think it's Sriracha. Um, Tobit, the Wisdom of Solomon, Judith, 2 Maccabees, and 1 Maccabees. Now, what you notice in this passage, in these um, books, is they're all dated to a certain date. They're all before Jesus, but they're after the time of, um, of Ezra. And it was widely believed by Jewish scholars in rabbinic testimony that literature in the second and through fifth centuries, as well as, or sorry, widespread, te widespread testimony in rabbinic literature in the second through fifth centuries, as well as the Josephus, he was a first century historian, outlines the belief that prophecy, authoritative canon, ended in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, which was in the Minor Prophets, which was about between 500 and 300 BC. I'm going to go back to that list. You notice a commonality in these books that are, are agreed upon in the, or they're in the Catholic Bible, but they are not necessarily in the Protestant Bible. They're in that time frame. That time frame that Jewish scholars believe that prophecy had ceased. And it wasn't until the time of Jesus that Christians believed that prophecy resumed. So we see that in that time frame, these books were written widely accepted by even Catholic scholars. But they still believe that they are, are authoritative. Some of these books, like 2 Maccabees, talk about the purgatory. And what happened was, is during that time frame, by the time of Ezra to about the time of Jesus, there was Greek influence happening. And that form of purgatory, that there was a, it's a Greek influence. And thinking had changed at that time. And that's where these writers got some of this stuff. Now, I'm not saying these books are evil. They're just not authoritative. And any pseudopigrapha, apocrypha, all these books that are kind of intertestamental times, we would say as Christians, as Protestant Christians, that they're good for wisdom and learning, but hold them not to the same level as Scripture, but to a good book, like by Billy Graham or someone else, because there is a lot of wisdom in these books. Some of these books are just genealogies and kind of ideas of what happened, and some of them double up some of our books in the Old Testament as well. So... These may be good things in there. And again, these are all good things to read and know, but don't hold them on the same level as Scripture. And then later books, pre-Jesus, we would, again, say are, are not evil, but just div not divinely inspired. And we also see that the Protestant Old Testament, the ones that we have here in our church, they're widely accepted by the Jewish scholars to be prophetic, that they are good and inspired by God. But as we look in the Bible, one of the things that we've really kind of, well, we, we see actually in our own Bibles, in our Protestant Bibles, that there's some verses that may be missing or in the footnotes, actually. In some of our New Testament, you'll see that it jumps from verse 15 to 20, or there's a big section of the book or passage that is not actually in the main section, or there's a note in the Bible that says, early manuscripts do not have 
these verses. And I would say that I'm, I'm a big Star Wars fan and Marvel and science fiction. And one of the things that hurt my heart was in 2004, the Star Wars universe was what they call retconned. And by retcon, I mean re-understanding canon. I don't know if you know this, but any, any kind of DVD or anything that was made after 2004, Anakin Skywalker is now Hayden Christensen. But before 2004, it was Alec, or um, I forget the guy, the gentleman that played Darth Vader. That was the original. 83 to 2004 was the original, that was the scene of the Force ghosts. But after 2004 to today, you will see a different person in there. They retconned it. They changed the understanding of who Anakin was. And why some of our Bible verses are missing is because some of the later manuscripts that we found did not have some of these verses. They were added possibly later. So it is in our own Bible footnotes. Our, our scripture says some of these verses aren't in the earliest manuscripts. And that's part of the reason we can trust the Bible is because when it, it is found to be retconned, redoing canon, our Bible scholars would say, well, actually, here's what we used to believe was true because that's the data we had. But once we found out that there was an older manuscript, we've changed it. And we, we keep that in there, but we also don't use that as canon. So we don't have the original writings of Scripture. We, we've, they've been lost to history. But we do have is a lot of manuscripts over the years that mostly agree word for word, years and years and years down the line. So many times, legends happened because the original happening was one way, and then we made it more exciting, more, more supernatural as it went down the line. But the reality is the majority of scriptures that we have the, all the way back actually agrees with each other. It hasn't been changed. It hasn't been retconned. And that's why we believe the historicity of Scripture. That's why we believe that we can trust this word. Is because we don't have the originals, nobody has them, but we have a lot of copies that all agree with each other. And just so you kind of get it, for those of us that are younger, it wasn't like there was copy machines that they were doing it. These were all handwritten people. Many of you guys that are a little bit older remember the day where copy machines were not a thing. It was, you had to take another piece of paper and cop, literally copy it by hand. And most of our old manuscripts are copied, actually all of our manuscripts are copied by hand by another person. And they all agree through history for the most part. And where they don't, we have made that adjustment in Scripture. So we can trust our Scriptures to lead us to truth. See, the Bible is more than just good words or sayings. We believe that the Bible is active in living. And in the EFCA belief that we are a part of, it says this, we believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, through the words of human authors, as verbally inspired word of God. Now, throughout Christianity, there's different viewpoints of what inspired word of God is, but the EFCA kind of lays it out. In the original context, in the original writings, it isn't that God has dictated to Peter or Mark or Paul, here's what you need to say. And, he, and Peter and Paul are just going, okay, we're writing these things down, everything God says. No, God gives them inspiration, and they write it in their own context, and their own thoughts, and their own words. So here's kind of an idea. In the Old Testament, back in the day before, well, not in the Old Testament, but when we were a long time ago, in the time of Galileo, there had people that used to say, that the earth was flat, that the sun 
revolved around the earth. And they got that because there was words in Scripture that alluded to that. These writers, they knew, they didn't have telescopes and satellites, all these things that would go up and tell us these things. But what they did have was their own eyes. And what they could see, it looked like the sun revolved around the earth. But in reality, today we know that the sun does not revolve around the earth. The earth is round, and the earth goes around the sun. But churches in the old days, before Galileo, they would take those that would say, no, the, sun, the earth goes around the sun, and they would kill them. They would, they would put them to, to death for disagreeing with Scripture. And this is what we mean by inspired word of God, was the Bible wasn't wrong. It just was their viewpoint, because God inspired these writers to see and write, and we needed to interpret the reality. So we fully did not discard Scripture when we learned that the earth was round or the earth revolved around the sun. Why? Because the people misinterpreted Scripture. They thought it was dictated, but it was inspired by God. I want to read the full statement of what the EFCA statement of faith says. It says, We believe that God has spoken in the Scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors as verbally inspired word of God. And then it says, the Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in that all it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. We need to understand that Scripture is through a lens, and we need to help ourselves get back to that lens. So when we interpret Scripture, we may be the ones that are wrong in our interpretations of it, but Scripture itself is not wrong. This brings us to our verse where I, I kind of, again, this whole talk was very apologetic and kind of argumentative about what, but there, there wasn't much Scripture to be had because this was all kind of, here's what how we do these things, then there isn't based on Scripture because we're understanding this is how we talk about Scripture. But 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all of Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And here's where I got to this young gentleman speaking to the truth to him when he said, I can't believe Christianity is real because of this. And I told him, it all happens, and it's all based on two things. One, open and closed hands. And here's what I mean by that. There are things in Scripture that we hold that if were false, Christianity would crumble. But there are also things that if we found out that, again, like the earth revolving around the sun, we need to hold with an open hand, and, and Christianity can stand on that. Some of our church things that we do are open-handed. Baptism, the way we do baptism here, needs to be an open-handed issue. Because if, some, if God himself, again, came down, and there was an audible voice one day, and said, you guys are doing baptism wrong. You need to have people dumped. Would it change our view of who God was? Would it change our view of Christianity? It shouldn't. Because baptism is a sign and seal. It is not the thing that everything hinges on. And again... We talk about having unity in the essentials and dialogue in the differences. Within our denomination, the EFCA, we have infant baptism, we have adult baptism, we have everything in between. And the reason we can have unity on these things is because we see good arguments for each way of doing things. Scripture kind of kind of leads us to two things. But each church has to deal with that and do what they do. We can't well, we're not going to do baptism because we don't know what to do. Scripture is pretty clear that we need to baptize. It's not as clear as how. 
So we follow the clear sayings and do to the best of our ability on some of the more murky commands. And that's why we would do infant baptism. And if someone came and said, I've never been baptized in an infant and I, I, I want to follow Jesus, I want to be baptized, and we would bring a baptismal, we would do a, an adult baptism for that person. But we follow infant baptism as our norm because we believe that Scripture is helping us understand that is best. But again, if God came down verbally and said, stop infant baptism, that's not what I meant, it would not put a hole in our belief in Christianity or the Scriptures for that matter. What does, and this is what I shared with this young gentleman, is Jesus. History is split by Jesus. Yeah, they've tried to change the terminology, but up until a few years ago, it was B.C. and A.D., before Christ and after death. And why it is, is because Jesus was such a figure in history that is well documented that we believe that Jesus, like, th there is very few people that would deny that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. There's so much documentation that Jesus was a real person. There is arguments about what he did and how he did and whatever happened, but the reality that Jesus is real needs to be our starting point. And that is a closed hand issue for us as Christians. Because if Jesus didn't live, if he didn't do the things he said and he didn't die and rise again, that actually puts our whole, whole belief system in question. Why are we doing here? If Jesus wasn't who he said he was, why do we meet like this? And Paul talks about that. So we would say that everything flows to Jesus and everything flows from him. So Everything pre-Jesus was leading up to his first coming, and everything afterwards, including today, is leading up to his second. Now, how he's coming back, we don't know. Scripture says the day and the hour are not known even by Jesus himself. But what we do know is he's coming back, and he will judge the living and the dead. That is a closed-hand issue for Christians and needs to be. But what happens if God comes back and says, the creation of the earth was not a literal seven days? Does that shake your belief in Christianity or God? Or what if he does come back and says, because maybe you don't believe it was a literal seven-day creation? If he came back and said, guys, I did it in seven days. Believe me. Would that blow up your thinking about what is true in the Bible or what is not? For some, it does. We get so hung up on the things that are a little bit more murky and a little bit more debatable that we miss the big E on the eye chart. Jesus! If Jesus is who he says he is, then everything else can come into play. We know we have the words of Jesus. We have the words of his followers in here. We have the words of Paul, who, who was persecuting Jesus' followers. And then some miraculous encounter, he starts saying, actually, Jesus, I was totally wrong. I, I thought I was right, but I'm totally wrong. How does that happen? How does a guy that is diametrically opposed to truth of Jesus go to being the biggest proponent for him. Only God. So don't get tripped up on the small letters on the eye chart and totally negate the big. Because if you get Jesus right, everything else in Scripture can fall into place. Jesus is not up for interpretation, and we're going to talk about that next week. We believe Jesus was a real person. He did what he said he did. And there's been debate about that, but we're going to talk to you about why that might be. But 
if you believe Jesus is who he says he is and get tripped up on the creation account or maybe some other account in the Old Testament, I would say maybe go back to the drawing board. Think about it. Because Jesus is the person that everything flows from and to. And here's the reason why I said it is because we have less evidence the further back we go in history. The further back we go in history, we don't have documentation and data. And we have to take some stuff on, well, on the word of what is in the word. But also, maybe it's a little bit more murky. And some of that stuff, we could maybe, some, I'm not saying all, but some of the stuff is up for interpretation. See, we believe that science is not the enemy of the Bible, but it also is not superior to it. Up until our recent times and the times in the Enlightenment and currently, science was actually, went hand in hand with religion. Science was a thing that was complementary. The science talked about the how, the Bible talked about the what and why. And where we differentiated, there was this dialogue, but it wasn't this science is proving the Bible wrong, the Bible is proving science wrong. We live in a day and age that we see that science is actually fallible. COVID proved that to us. We know now things we didn't know when COVID first hit, but science was super sure. And some of us didn't buy it. Some of us bought it wholesale. But in reality, science is doing with the data that they have in the moment. And as the data changes, science will too. It's the way it's supposed to work. But the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to understand that. Have a good understanding of what science is and what scripture is. We will always live this life that has some tension between us, what is revealed and what is hidden. God doesn't reveal everything to us. But one day, Scripture says, that we will know fully as we are already fully known. And we believe in that. So there's going to be things about Scripture that we don't know and we have to interpret and try our best but we can't miss the big E on the E chart or on the I chart. That is a given and everything else flows to and from it. So how do we study scripture? How do we do this? Well, I have three things for us. Seek grace and truth. John 1.14 says that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is grace and truth. Where we have differences, we should be open to learning why someone else believes something else. But also seeking truth in that as well. So where you don't agree, have grace but always constantly be seeking, what is Jesus saying? We should know what should be open-handed and closed-handed. First John, again, 4, one says that, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. John himself says this. There are many false prophets in the world. They've gone out, but test them. Not everything that is said is true. We no longer have prophecy to some extent. It ended at the end. There's no more canon to be said. But I've seen it so many times that someone says, I got a word from the Lord. And I've had people say some really wonky stuff to me. And... I've never said this, but I've wanted to, because, but it's not graceful. <laughs> I've, said, I've had people say, I've got a word of the Lord. You need to blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, he should tell me. 
And maybe he is. But there's been many times where I've had people try to tell me one thing, and God is telling me something else. Who is right? Seek grace and truth. Last one. Don't be afraid of the debatable, but be charitable in the debatable. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. One of the things I, again, it, it, it unsettles me, but I'm, I'm grateful for it, is those that are on the opposing view of what I believe about Scripture. There are some that I diametrically disagree with, but I still listen to them. Why? Because I'm seeking wisdom, and I'm seeking to be sharpened. Have my own beliefs in Scripture sharpened. Not everyone can handle that, but I'm just saying that I, it, it unsettles me, but it's good for me. Don't believe everything, as John said. Test the spirits. But don't be afraid of the debatable. Be charitable in that, though. 1 Corinthians, and I alluded to this earlier. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12 says this. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, and that's Jesus, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I don't know if you know this, but children reason in absolutes. It's black or white. There's no gray. He's talking like that. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we should see only... We see only a reflection as in the mirror. For then we shall see face to face. This is Paul talking here. The guy who knows a lot. I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. When you and I get to heaven and meet Jesus face to face, or when he comes back and we meet him face to face, we will be fully, we will fully know as we are fully known. And it's not going to be like, okay, Jesus sets you down and he's like, okay, here's our class on what God is really like. We will just know. And at that moment, I believe myself and many others will be like, wow, I can't believe I got all that wrong. But I got the big E right. I got the big E on the I chart, and it's Jesus. So I tell you this to say that I'm fallible. Just as much as everyone else, even the smartest person in the world, is fallible. But I'm doing the best of my ability to help us as a church know that we can trust Scripture. There's so much to trust in Scripture. And we should dig in and be changed by it. When we started this series, I said it all comes down to an, a personal encounter with Jesus. Much like Paul. Paul met him on the road to go do some horrible things to Christians. And after that, he was changed for life. One of the things I believe is that you and I, you and I, if we don't have that personal experience, we could read this book from cover to end multiple times and still not get what God has for us. There's good things in here. But without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we cannot be fully changed and continue to be changed. So we try our best to do what God calls us to do. To be charitable where we have differences, to be loving, but don't miss Jesus because that everything hinges on him. Let's pray. God, there's a lot today. I crammed so much information. But we need to hear this stuff. We need to understand that that the world is good, you created it good, but we've fallen away. And that we don't know, fully know, but one day we will. And you give us revelation through Scripture to help us to live new and redeemed lives. But even the smartest guy on the planet still has big holes and knows in part. So we know that you only, we know we need to trust you, Jesus, as best we can. Study well, 
seek grace and truth. And I pray that we do that to the best of our ability. Love those who are being changed by you, pursued by you. And we pray as we get ready to take communion today that we were reminded of why we believe what we believe and everything else can fill in the blanks later. Help us, Lord, change us. Renew us from the inside out. Thanks again for being with us today. And we pray your time with us was blessed, encouraging, and challenging as well as we dive into these very difficult topics. If you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'll, I'll try my best to share what I know and point you somewhere maybe to someone who knows a little bit more as well. Now, we don't have all the answers, but we have a verdict that just causes us to say, I think this is reality. There's always gonna be arguments against biblical truth, but there's a lot of arguments for it as well. As we wrap up, hear this benediction out of the book of 1 Timothy. Paul says to Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you and you as well. We hope you have a great week. We'd love to see you in person. Bye.